So hello everyone, my name is uh, Stabi Lakolwa. Um, I am a lecturer and early career research astronomer at the University of Johannesburg. And I'm affiliated with IDEA as well as uh, Surreo. And um, I'm very interested in the developments of the SKA project, particularly with uh, the SKA Pathfinder that we have now already established as a 64 antenna array. Yes, their cat. So I'm going to share with you some res uh, preliminary results from um, Meerkat uh, radio continuum data, as well as the UGMRT, which is um, the upgraded giant meter wave radio telescope located in Pune in India. And um, I'm interested in studying radio sources, particularly those that are identified as galaxies and that have properties um, that indicate that they host active galactic nuclei in some cases and are star forming in other cases. Okay. So to begin with, uh, Meerkat has had uh, eight large survey projects established. Uh, they have been reported already since 2016 and each of these large survey projects also known as LSPs cover very distinct science cases. I operate under the MITI LSP, which is the Meerkat International Gigahertz Tiered Extragalactic Exploration, which aims to use radio continuum data in the L-band currently and in future in the S-band to study the evolution of active galactic nuclei, host galaxies, and star-forming galaxies in order to determine how AGN and star formation activity evolve with cosmic time. That's with the continuum data. The MITE group also has a dedicated cohort of individuals that are interested in spectral line observations, particularly of the H121 centimeter line, which is used to constrain the cosmic density of neutral gas. And that will be a very important result because Meerkat is uh, perhaps at this point, the most sensitive radio telescope, and it will provide excellent constraints on this particular function. And thirdly, there is a group that's dedicated to using spectral polarimetric observations. That's, of course, the Stokes I, Q, U, and V um, detections in the radio in order to probe magnetic fields in galaxy clusters and filaments, and this is very important work as well. So the aim for mighty continuum specifically in the end is to obtain deep, and by deep we mean with a flux limit of two microjanskis and wide uh, surveying over an area of up to 20 degrees squared of four particular fields on the sky, that is XMM LSS, Cosmos, Elias S1, and the E Chandra Deep Field South Fields. Now the selection for these four is guided predominantly by the fact that they have all been observed via multi-wavelength uh, surveys in the past and therefore contain a wealth of ancillary data that will be useful to us when we begin to make use of the radio continuum data as we are doing now. Frequency coverage in the L-band is over 880 to 1670 megahertz approximately. Um, so as we'll see later, this is excellent for tracing non-thermal synchrotron radio emission processes in galaxies. At the particular time, we have early science pointings that have been completed on the COSMOS and XMM LSS fields uh, for the mighty continuum data. They've been reported in Haywood et al. 2021 over the COSMOS field, a single pointing that extends to 1.6 degrees squared um, is shown on the right-hand side over there. Uh, on the left-hand side, excuse me. And you'll notice that in addition to this myriad of thousands of point sources, as you can see in white, we also have some extended radio sources, particularly this one over here, which in addition to, I believe this one over here, 
Oh, wait, no, they're this one over here, in addition to this one over here, which I'll come to just now, in terms of the pointings, uh, have been identified as giant radio galaxies and were reported by Del Hayes et al. 2020. In fact, to much fanfare, um, Jacinta Del Hayes was uh, uh, able to uh, get sufficient, in fact, um, unexpectedly <laughs> um, uh, high uh, praise from the press and the scientific community for this discovery of these giant radio galaxies in the early science point. And so we've already made some decent progress in uh, obtaining um, excellent results from the early science. So now on the XMM LSS fields, we have three pointings uh, that are mosaiced. As you can see over here, the overlaps between the pointings, which result in a total area surveyed of 3.5 square degrees. For these images, the spatial resolution, when we minimize the flux limit or we minimize the RMS, the thermal noise to 1.7 microjanskis per beam, the spatial resolution of 8.6 arc seconds is achieved. There are alternative images that have been created through the imaging and calibration pipeline by Ian Haywood and team, where the spatial resolution is minimized to, uh, oh, excuse me, where the spatial resolution is, oh, let me get this right. Um, yes, the spatial resolution is minimized. So in other words, the resolving power is increased down to five arc seconds. And in these images, uh, the RMS um, is a factor of three larger. So it goes up to six microjanskis per beam. So generally there is a trade-off between your spatial resolution or your resolving power and your flux limit or thermal noise threshold. So in addition to those two factors, we also have what we call the classical confusion limit, which occurs at 4.5 microjanskis per beam in the case for images that achieve an eight arc second spatial resolution. And what this tells us is that in regions of the image where there is source crowding, where there's a high density of radio sources, below 4.5 microjanskis, it becomes almost impossible to distinguish between sources or to tell them apart. So we essentially limited by confusion at um, the lowest flux limits achievable. So in order to obtain some information about the radio sources uh, and also to classify them or to confirm that they are indeed galaxies, Cross-matching the radio image with the optical and near-infrared surveys that already exist is of fundamental importance. But the first step in this process has been a identification of radio sources using the Pi BDSF or the Python Blob Detection and Selection func uh, Finder, um, which is used to identify the Gaussian components in fields, essentially. So each individual radio source is uh, identified as a Gaussian component by the algorithm. But of course the problems that arise are for sources that have extended radio morphologies, such as the case for the giant radio galaxies, multiple Gaussian components may be assigned to a single source. So as a re result of that, it becomes slightly complicated to when it comes to cataloging radio sources and ensuring that individual radio sources are uh, considered. But overall, as a result of this source finder um, run on Cosmos and XMM LSS, roughly this number of sources have been detected in both fields. Of course, XMM LSS has a wider area and therefore the number of radio sources identified is a factor of two greater than that in the cosmos field. And in order to um, robustly determine optical and near infrared counterparts to the radio sources, the so-called likelihood ratio is used as a, as a way of determining which matches are correct and which ones are, are 
well, excuse me, not matches that are incorrect and correct, but as a way of determining which source in the radio catalog matches up to the source in the optical near infrared catalog. So it's a way of maximizing the probability of matching two sources in a way. And as you can see, the likelihood ratio equation is a, a product and a quotient of probabilities with QM being the expected distribution of true counterparts. So that those are the, the true matches to the optical, excuse me, true matches to the radio in the optical and infrared catalog. And the F of R is the radial distribution of all offsets between radio and optical or near infrared sources within a specific um, aperture on the sky projected aperture. And N of M is the magnitude distribution of the optical and near infrared catalog. So essentially when you maximize this LR, um, this product and quotient of probabilities, you are able to maximize the, the probability of, of a radio source matching up to an optical and infrared source. So this is shown, it's plotted out for um, the low resolution and high resolution catalogs on the cosmos field. Um, what you see is um, each of those scatter points represents the source and you have generally a likelihood ratio um, maximized in, in your lowest separations. And this, it tapers down all the way up to about 1.5 arc seconds. So this indicates to us that we are obtaining the most reliable matches within 1.5 arc seconds um, separation between radio and optical and infrared sources. This plot also shows um, the distinction between correct and incorrect matches, which are identified through the process of simply looking at sources that have been flagged as difficult to match. So a group of volunteers, um, astronomers within the working group took the time to look at individual cases and identify where matches between the radio and optical and near-infrared catalog were correct and where they were incorrect. So as expected in the low resolution catalog, we have a much higher number of incorrect matches relative to the high resolution catalog where um, we are able to properly distinguish between individual sources up to five arc second. And all of that was, uh, was reported in Prescott et al, in, uh, which is submitted. Okay, so our ancillary data that's already available in XMM LSS from legacy surveys uh, covers low frequency radio um, L band as well, but to a higher resolution with a very large array. So we've got LOFAR and GMRT for the low frequency radio, the BLA. Um, roughly covering the L band. We've also got far infrared um, survey results from Herschel and uh, mid infrared from Spitzer, optical data from CFHT and Vista and video optical data, which is an essential for um, the redshifts of our sources, and Subaru Hyper Supreme CAM optical data, as well as uh, XMM serves X ray detections for the sources in XMM LSS. So as far as multi-wavelength studies go, this is very possible already. And similarly for Cosmos, uh, legacy surveys have provided uh, VLA data at three gigahertz. It's uh, now ed edging towards the S-band and optical HST data is available for the Cosmos field. Again, a CFHT as well as the Ultra Vista um, survey. The Super Hyper Supreme CAM has also got coverage in Cosmos and Spitzer, and infrared data is available, as well as X ray data from Exma, Newton, and Chandra. So, for the study that I will be undertaking, um, which involves two uh, instruments, in fact, two arrays, that's the upgraded giant meter wave radio telescope in Pune, India, and Meerkat, of course, we have a continuum imaging already 
on the XMM LSS field. And the commensal observations of UGMRT and Meerkat have been um, named uh, super mighty. Essentially, uh, they're an extension of the mighty continuum um, science. And they've been, this project has been approved by the Indian Department of Science and Technology and the South African National Research Foundation in a bilateral agreement. So it's a very official project, much um, as much like the Meerkat Mighty LSP is on its own. So the spectral coverage in total um, for, for these two surveys would be 250 megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz. So GMRT allows us to probe down to observing frequencies that are significantly lower than the L-band, slightly lower than the L-band. And the aim of SuperMighty is really to study the deep microjansky sky um, in terms of looking at the cosmic evolution of neutral hydrogen and also obtaining constraints of molecular gas and star formation. And determining, of course, how star forming galaxies and radio AGN have evolved. So there is, of course, uh, a clear extension of super mighty, of, of mighty to super mighty. So my particular project, um, I'm interested in determining how we can use our radio continuum data to trace synchrotron processes at the cores of radio AGN host galaxies. So generally, the underlying mechanisms behind this non-thermal radiation is the formation of relativistic jets, as shown by this schematic over here. Generally, you would have an accretion of gas onto the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy at the core of a galaxy. We know supermassive black holes exist at the cores of galaxies. In fact, we've even observed directly with VLBI two, one at in the center of our Milky Way and also the center of M87. But in radio AGN, active galactic nuclei, these supermassive black holes tend to exceed 1 million solar masses. So that's 10 to the six solar masses and can extend up to solar masses of 10 to the nine, so a billion solar masses. So they are significantly more massive than what we have at the center of our Milky Way. And as a result, the radiative processes are, are more violent, you can say, at the cores of AGN host galaxies. So you have the accretion of gas onto the, the disk. Through conservation of angular momentum, a disk is formed as the gas accretes onto the supermassive black hole. And through um, processes that are described wonderfully in Blanford and Znajek, um, there is a conversion of energy from the accreted gas, a mass to energy conversion, which results in the launching of jets, okay? magnetized jets. And Given that the ionized gas in the vicinity of the accretion disk is heated, it's ionized. Electrons are freely moving in the vicinity of the core. And when they gyrate around magnetic field lines in the jets, they emit what we know as synchrotron radiation. So this is a very important process by which we are able to detect jets because synchrotron radiation is traced observationally in the radio frequencies. So that's essentially why active galactic nuclei are strong radio sources. Um, I've given you an equation for the synchrotron power and it's got some betas and gammas, which indicates to us that there are relativistic processes taking place within the jets at the atomic scale, but on the Macro scale, what we observe are jet morphologies and non thermal emission that is traced in the radio. Mm -hmm. So, knowing this, we can use our radio spectral, radio spectral energy distributions 
to understand which processes take place at which frequencies essentially. And this is explained very wonderfully in Kerr et al. 2012. This is a graph plot taken from that paper. It shows the radio flux as a function of observed frequency at redshift zero, redshift two, redshift six. As you know, the frequencies will shift to lower and lower, or I should say your, your rest frequency will be shifted as a result of an increase in redshift, which means that each of these processes will be observed at a frequency that is dependent on the redshift of the source, essentially. So for instance, we trace emission from the lobes where we know that there's synchrotron emission as well as inverse Compton scattering and synchrotron self-absorption taking place. If the source was nearby, this would be between 10 megahertz and roughly 10 gigahertz. But for sources that are further away, this will change to roughly, let's say, five or one, one megahertz to roughly two gigahertz. Okay. So I may have uh, said the wrong thing before. What we see is that the frequencies, the rest frame frequencies, um, are shifted to, to higher, higher and higher frequencies, essentially, as the redshift increases. So at 1.4 gigahertz, in the L band, we trace the non thermal radiation either from the lobes or the core. And we also get beamed orientation for type one sources where the core is not obscured in any way. And in fact, emission from the jets is almost parallel to the line of sight. It's at a basically beamed radiation is at a small angle to the line of sight, we get emission at roughly frequencies, rest frame frequencies of 100 gigahertz and so on and so forth. So this is a, a schematic that essentially gives you a guiding line into knowing which processes are traced at which frequencies depending on the redshift of the source. So in our study, we'll be using the spectral index, which is alpha, which is essentially the, the power to the frequency when our flux density is proportional to the frequency to the power of alpha. So our alpha tells us how steep the radio spectral energy distribution is at a given frequency. And we generally measure the spectral index between two frequencies, and it would be given by this ratio over here, where you've got a log of a, a ratio of the two radio flux densities measured between the two observing bands divided by log the ratio of your frequencies measured. So two sets of spectral indices essentially would then give us not just a measure of how steep the radio spectral energy distribution is, but how it curves. So you get a delta alpha measure. And that's important for determining how much energy has been lost by electrons in the relativistic processes. It's also important for determining whether a radio source has emission that is predominantly produced in the core or in the lobes. And that's essential for understanding the morphology of the radio emission. And secondly, we're able to distinguish between radio emission from active galactic nuclei and radio emission from star-forming galaxies where we trace the star-forming regions more strongly than the core, which is not active in the case of a star-forming galaxy. So an initial study using the Meerkat Mighty data, early science data in the cosmos field has already produced some results here a selection of star-forming galaxies have been determined and using 
the VLA, Very Large Array and Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescopes um, data, so that's low frequency and L band and um, high frequency VLA data. Um, Angia has been able to use um, this uh, a catalog of star forming galaxies to show that spectral indices generally tend to, to steepen quite slightly with stellar mass. And this is an important result because we need to know the relation between um, how the galaxy growth and how a galaxy accumulates its mass and to which results in the stellar mass um, we measure for it and what radio processes are taking place within the galaxy. So this is a very important correlation for radio galaxy or radio AGN classification, but, and also star formation forming galaxy classification, right? And another observation that Fangia made was that there's a flattening of spectral indices for the brightest sources in the field. So generally for star forming galaxies, we expect the radio spectral energy distributions to flatten because we know that there is a, a loss of, of energies in the electrons. Um, due to um, the, the propagation, me, loss of energy in the electrons due to spectral aging, spectral aging in the star forming galaxies. So for um, Eugia Martin um, Meerkat L band, um, to begin with in, in our particular study, so this is some preliminary results from my work. Um, I'm combining, we are combining um, UGMRT and Meerkat L-band images um, in XMM LSS and cross-correlating them in band three, which is at 380 megahertz and band four, which is at 690 megahertz and also in the Meerkat L-band at 1.3 gigahertz roughly. And the um, initial point um, in our study is to determine how well matched the spatial resolution between the catalogs is and we find by looking at um, a delta alpha and delta delta, so that offset and right ascension and offset and declination between um, the UGMRT and Meerkat surveys, uh, we don't have a, a significantly high spread in this regard. So that tells us that the resolution is well matched and uh, that we'd be able to get reliable cross matches between the Meerkat L band catalog and the UGMRT catalog. Uh, secondly, what we want to understand is how the flux limits change between the different bands that we're observing. I think this is important for knowing how biased our spectral index measures will be. As if in an ideal case, all three observing bands, that band three and band four in UGMRT and Meerkat L band, they all had the same flux limit, then we could safely say that um, there is no bias that is introduced into our spectral index measures because we're not losing sources due to the fact that some sources are being detected in one band and not being detected in another band and therefore we're not able to measure that, that slope or that spectral index between those two bands. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case here. We have a variation in flux limit between the bands. And um, that is plotted here schematically where I show the distribution of sources um, in terms of their flux densities in each of the bands, band three, 380 megahertz, band four, 690 megahertz in UGMRT, and Meerkat L band 1.28 gigahertz, um, which turns out to be the wavelength band, which or frequency band, which has the lowest flux limit since Meerkat is, is indeed very sensitive. So what this actually does when we are trying to measure our spectral indices is the following. If we had some hypothetical case, okay, um, where we know that band three has um, the highest flux density, band four has um, intermediate, um, excuse me, that band three has the highest flux limit in terms of flux density, band four has a mid range uh, flux limit between band three and Meerkat L band and Meerkat has the, the lowest flux limit 
what we end up with is a situation where we're losing out on sources that have either flat spectral index um, such that um, their band three flux densities are below the band three flux limit. And we also lose out on sources with rising uh, spectral indices. And this is assuming that their band three flux limits are below the flux limit, of course, of band three. Another effect we would result in is the dominance of sources that have negative spectral indices, because very conveniently, um, the, the flux limits kind of drop, they decrease with increasing frequency, which means that uh, our spectral index measures will simply be skewed or biased towards sources that have negative spectral indices. So all of this is a result of, of course, the, the variation in flux limits. So you can see this already in our preliminary results where we've taken uh, band three, band four spectral index, and we've drawn out the distributions. The black distribution shows all the sources um, uh, within the radio source catalog. And um, we decided to limit our band four flux limit um, in, this, in the green distribution to roughly 100 microjanskis. And the result is, as you can see very clearly, a loss of sources. Um, so we're already seeing evidence for a bias. And um, between band four, UGMRT and Meerkat L-band, we did a, a similar test, uh, tracing the distributions um, through and comparing them when we take all the sources and uh, to when we have a very specific minimum threshold in the flux density for band four. And although the effect is not as extreme as what we saw between band three and band four, there is some, some bias already there. But the difference between flux limits between band four and Meerkat L band are not as extreme. So that's probably why we're not seeing the effect um, um, most more significantly here. Right. So another a result that we have so far preliminarily is uh, the function of spectral index uh, relative to a band four lower limit. Now we're looking at um, a change in that band four lower limit. So we're taking that threshold, that lower limit in our um, source distribution and we're making it go higher and higher of course, on the on the x axis, and um, although we would expect a flattening, okay, so we would expect our spectral indices to approach zero at lower flux limits because generally star forming galaxies have flat spectral indices and they're also fainter in the radio continuum. So we expect to see more star forming galaxies at low flux limits. We don't necessarily observe that spectral flattening. In fact, we, we get a spectral steepening. And when we, yeah, that's when we compare band three and band four. And when we compare band four and Meerkat L band, we see a kind of, uh, not much of a trend, but our spectral indices are not exactly approaching zero either, um, as we would expect. So both of these plots represent the entire radio source catalog. Um, so it will include star forming galaxies and radio AGN. So what we would need to do um, in order to get a constraint on how the different populations, um, how their spectral indices change um, with flux limit, we would need to, to classify the population properly into star forming galaxies and radio AGN. And one way to do that is through multi-wavelength diagnostics that have been applied in the literature. So looking at our band three, band four flux density, excuse me, band three and four spectral index over here on the y-axis and then our band four and meerkat L band spectral index, we can compare these two to form what we call the radio color color plot for the spectral index distribution in two dimensions to see how many sources have the so-called falling 
spectral indices. So that's the monotonically decreasing spectral index and then the rising spectral index, the monotonically increasing spectral index and how many of them are downturned such that there's an increase in spectral index and a decrease spectral index or there's a, an upturned, that means there's a decrease in spectral index and an increase. So we're looking at uh, the different spectral curvature shapes that we recover and very clearly there's a dominance of sources that are monotonically decreasing in spectral index as you go from band three to band four to near cat L band. So that clearly is the bias that we expected. And you can see that when we look at the fraction of sources that as a result, as a, as a function of the different shapes in spectral curvature. So the result of this of course is due to the variation in flux limit and also due to the Eddington bias which describes the stochastic fluctuations in flux density as you go to um, lower and lower fluxes. Um, that increases essentially the uncertainty in the flux density that you measure. So for the faintest sources, it's um, quite tricky to constrain their flux densities due to this effect. So final, application of our spectral indices is in looking at the so-called alpha Z correlation, which has been traditionally considered a method for finding high redshift radio AGN, but slowly and slowly we're realizing that it is not the most robust method. And we have some clear evidence for that in this preliminary study, combining low far and uh, 150 megahertz and BLA 1.5 gigahertz data, we obtained spectral indices for radio sources as a function of redshift. And, and while we do observe the alpha Z correlation, when we split this population, the entire population into two distinct populations, one at low redshift and one at high redshift, we don't measure any statistical difference between the two distributions. So that tells us that we're essentially tracing similar populations at low and high redshift using the alpha Z correlation. So it's not a, re a reliable way of finding high redshift. Radio AGN and what this evidence tells us is that we would need to um, determine more robust methods for, cons for finding the, the most distant uh, radio galaxies or radio loud and radio quiet AGN, which um, would represent some of the, the first galaxies to form in the universe after the epoch of reionization. So that is ongoing work. And to summarize what I've spoken about here, our meerkat mighty early science cosmos and XMM L-band observations uh, are already in existence and uh, are complemented by a rich set of multi-wavelength ancillary data that we will use to carry out our science. And commensal UGMRT and Meerkat observations are also available through SuperMighty. And that is the data that we are currently using to constrain spectral indices and spectral curvature of star-forming galaxies and radio AGN in order to determine what the, what's the shapes of the the radio spectral energy distributions are at the frequencies we have um, observations for, and that will give us information about the processes underlying the production of radio emission in these different galaxies and also how they correlate with properties such as stellar mass, as we saw in Fungia's paper. And all in all, the alpha Z correlation is not a robust method for selecting high redshift radio AGN, and we are currently working on new methods for properly tracing this population. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, Stabili, for the talk. Yeah, I should probably. Um, uh, so we have a time for questions. So let me know if you have questions. Okay, uh, Professor Ma. Uh, hello, hello. Hi. Yes. 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 Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Nice talk. Nice talk. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, my I think my question is uh, 
if uh, so, I wonder just really a preliminary question. Uh, does most of the um, synchrotron, like uh, galactic and and also intergalactic synchrotron radiation, uh, are are most of these radiation produced by 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 AGNs and by by these magnum? Um, yeah. So I think uh, most of the burgeoning evidence at this point for sources that are active that are known to be active. Um, that are generally very, very massive. They're, they have high stellar masses, so in the K-band, they'd be identified, of course, using multi-wavelength diagnostics, such as your K-band magnitudes will allow you to constrain stellar mass and sources that are radio emitting, that have high mm -hmm, stellar mm -hmm. masses, those are assumed to be, to be radio AGN. And um, we mm -hmm. then go on to assume that the non-thermal synchrotron processes at the core are responsible primarily for the radio emission. Um, as far as other sources of radio emission, um, other than the core, and um, of course the, the jets, which propagate into the interstellar medium and form lobes, um, I, I can't think of any that I've read about so far or even seen, yeah. I see, uh, just another uh, related question. So I, I do see people using a bit higher frequency, like those, uh, you know, hundred gigahertz or like uh, or ten gigahertz, uh, ten gigahertz high frequency uh, measurement to to calibrate that uh, synchrotron radiation spectral index. So I mm -hmm. guess that's just on the higher frequency end of, of this pursuit, right? Uh, of this, uh, of this, um, yes. uh, this, this, this whole kind of uh, attempt to characterize the spectrum, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. So, yeah, generally the observing frequencies for synchrotron radiation are one to 10 gigahertz. And above that, mm. you begin to trace the thermal processes. That's the free free emission, um, mm. that, um, which is actually quite predominant in star forming galaxies. Um, so, at, a, at 10 gigahertz, let me think about the rest frequency. Mm. That would be effective for nearby sources. So that's close to redshift zero. Definitely you'd, you'd be tracing synchrotron yeah. radiation, but as you go to higher redshifts, of course, then you'd go down to lower frequencies in order to observe synchrotron radiation, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yes. I, I see other, there are European projects like Quixote and other uh, basically microwave range of, um, observation, mm -hmm. try to measure the spectrum over the range of 10 to 100 gigahertz. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, okay. and which is, uh, you know, which is on higher frequency. Okay, thank you for your answer, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ma, thank you. <laughs>